And so we're going to dive into this this morning. John 4, verses 31 and 34. We're talking about our relationship responsibility. And we come, we come into an interesting story here. And it says, meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food that you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked. So natural minded, right? Jesus is probably like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do with you guys? The disciples asked each other and then Jesus explained, look at this. My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. Some interesting words in here. My nourishment. You've been needing some nourishment lately? Jesus said, my nourishment comes from doing his work. I think it's the same for us. Our true nourishment, our true fulfillment comes from doing his work. And look at this, and fulfilling or finishing his work. This has hit me hard lately, that God's wanting some people to team up with him and live out his heartbeat and fulfill his desire. And that's where our true nourishment comes. And notice the word doing, from doing. My nourishment comes from doing his work. And so God's called us to do something. Well, I wanna go back and kind of show you a little bit about what's going on in this story. And so if we look at John 4, verses six and 10, we'll kind of catch up a little bit on what's happening here. It says, Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired from a long walk, sat wearily beside the well at noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone to the village to buy him some food and the woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you're speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. This is what's happening here. This is what fulfilled Jesus. The nourishment that he got was this right here. And I thought this was interesting because it shows us the humanity of Jesus. Don't ever put things off on Jesus like, well, that was Jesus. No, Jesus was 100% man. He drained himself of all deity and became man on the earth to show that we can do what he did. And so I thought it was interesting that he was tired from a long journey. And so you think about him sitting against this well. He's not sitting there with a little halo over his head, floating, right? Just waiting for someone to minister to. No, he is wore out. It's like, oh, uh, he's probably got dirt in his mouth and sand coming down his eyes. And it's just like, oh, man, right? You ever felt like that before? Jesus is wore out. He's tired from his journey. Look at that. He sat wearily beside the well. I, I think this is interesting because even though he's wore out and he's tired and he's exhausted, who do you like to think about in that moment? Yourself, right? Nobody else. Leave me alone. I just want a bath with a bunch of oils in it, right? <laughs> Give me all oily. That's me. Just sitting there until I can't sit up. I just keep sliding to the bottom because <laughs> I'm short, so I can't put, yeah, yeah, anyway. Bathtubs are hard. Anyway, Jesus is wore out. He could totally be thinking about himself, but he's not because he knows I've got a job to do. And we're in this place all the time where we're wore out. Something's on our minds. Something's weighing on us. We have all the excuse we could to just be thinking about ourselves. But Jesus knows where his nourishment comes from. And he knows if I minister to this woman, it'll be doing the work of God. And this is cool to me because Jesus had cultural permission Listen to me, Jesus had cultural permission to completely ignore this woman. He had all the permission he needed to completely ignore this woman and not even give her the time of day. And on top of that, he's exhausted. You ever just ignored somebody? I have, he had complete permission. He didn't even have to talk, he could have been, he could have been disrespectful if he wanted. Total cultural permission. He says, would you give me a drink? because he knows I'm going somewhere, I've got work to do. And it's amazing to me that he lays aside the struggles of the moment to minister to a lost. <coughs> this responsibility of knowing God, but also this responsibility of giving away, giving it away. 
And she goes physical because she, he says, give me a drink. And she says, well, you're saying you can, why are you asking me for a drink? And he says, if you only knew the gift that God had for you. That's what we give away, church. We have a gift to give away to people. He said, if you only knew the gift that God has for you, you'd be asking me for water. You know you have that gift in you already? A lot of times we think we're still looking for it, but you have it already to give away. And she goes physical because the Bible says unspiritual people don't understand spiritual things. And so she's like, in verse 11 through 19, you don't even have a rope for a bucket, she said. And and this well's very deep. And so where are you gonna get this living water you're talking about? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he is his sons and his animals enjoyed. And Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water so that I never am thirsty again and I won't have to keep coming over here to get water. You know what? The lost are always up for a good deal. Sounds great. I'll take it, right? Yeah, that sounds like a great deal. Give me the water. But Jesus had to go a little deeper. Remember a few weeks ago how we preached on salt and light? Remember that? The salt always makes room for the light. Well, Jesus was just spreading salt with this woman, talking about water in the well. And she's like, sure, I'll take that water. You know what happens? The light turns on. And this is, remember I talked about this where it gets awkward. That's why it's so important to build relationships right? Build relationships, not just minister to people. Find out who they are because Jesus is about to turn the light on. Look at this. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. Well, I don't have a husband. The light's on. I don't have a husband, she said. You're right. You don't have a husband for you've had five husbands and you aren't married to the man you're living with now. Well, you certainly spoke the truth, sir. The woman said, and it's all their fault, right? No, she didn't say that. Common denominator. Okay, I'll stop right there. (laughs) You must be a prophet, she says. See that? Jesus turns on the light. Boom. Because he cared about her soul. The woman left her water jar. I, I think it's interesting the Bible says that. There's something significant in there. It's pregnant. She left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village and told everyone, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? You know, here she's telling the town about a man again. They're like, oh yeah, you and your men, number six. Oh yeah, she met a man, everyone. Imagine that. (laughs) He told me everything I ever did. She says he could be the the Messiah. See, I think it's interesting that she left her water jar because I I think there's something there with the light came on and she knew she could leave that past. She knew something's changing. Something's about to shift in this routine of my life, this routine that I've had in my life over and over and over again is about to change. And she leaves her water jar at the well and runs. That's her whole purpose for being there. Her purpose is about to change. And it's interesting that she says, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. He didn't tell her everything she ever did. Did you guys see that in that story? I'm sure there's a lot more than that. Here's what I felt like the Lord told me is that the lost always define themselves by their failures because they don't have anything else to define by. And when it comes to God being in the picture, people who are lost or who don't know him, they're always defining themselves by their failures. They're always defining themselves by where they've missed it or where it's gone wrong and they can very rarely see past where they've missed it to link up to God. Come see the man who's told me everything I did wrong. Come see the man who's told me everything I've ever identified myself by is what she's saying because Jesus turned the light on and I'm telling you when we're dealing with the lost they, they have a gap. The Bible says this in Colossians 1, 21 and 22, that, that they're enemies in their own minds with God because of their evil behavior. God's not mad at them. God's not calling them enemies. But when people are constantly living in evil behavior, they're lost. They're enemies in their own mind with God. They think he's mad at them. They think there's this huge gap and this huge distance. And I'm never going to be able to get across that gap to find him. It's a lie of the enemy. 
And that's what's happening right here with this woman. And Jesus is just shining the light on her. And then we pick up here where the disciples bring him food. Back to our story in verse 35. With an explanation of the very time we're in as well. And it says this, you know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. For the fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What, look at this, what joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? You know what I think that's saying? Is there's joy with us and God. We're doing the work on earth. God's pouring water on them. God's causing them to grow and there's joy with us and him alike. We're teaming up with God and reaping the harvest. We're bringing in the harvest. We got work to do. Don't look around and say, oh, the harvest will be here one day. He's saying, no, it's here right now. It's around you right now. You just got to be aware of it. You got to be able to lay your worst day aside and think about somebody's first day. Or we're all going to be lost. We're all going the wrong direction. See, we have so much to give away so much. But I believe the devil will never let you believe that. He'll never let you have that for free, that you actually have something to offer. And Jesus is trying to share here that the harvest is right now. And we go, we see Jesus was fulfilled by something other than food. And it was doing the will of God. And then we go all the way back and rewind. Well, what's the will of God that he was doing? He was finding the one and shining the light on their life. And it was nourishment. He was going after the lost and turning the light on to let them know my God loves you. And you don't have to be defined by your failures anymore because there's a gift that God has for you. And it's salvation. And just like I received it, I'm gonna commit my life to giving it away. To giving it away to the world. I love that. And you know what? That's why the enemy's constantly telling you that you don't have something to give because he wants to deceive you. But do you know you have more than you think to give away to this world? The things you do on a daily basis would blow somebody away. Your normal routine of life would probably blow somebody away and get them out of the muck and mire because they don't have a clue. They're just, they don't even know where they are. The Bible says they trip and they don't even know what's tripping them. We have so much to offer. And so we take these scriptures and we realize that the message is simple and it's from the heart. And we give away the promise of God. We need to let him lead our lives. Let him be Lord over us and lead our lives and give away this friendship with God to the world. Second Corinthians chapter five, verses 18 and 21. We looked at this last week, but I want to hit it again because a lot of times we make this job so hard. The job of witnessing to the world, we make it so hard and it's not. Look at this. God said, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. You know what that word means? To be friends with God again. That is awesome. Who allowed us to be friends with him again through Jesus Christ and gave us the ministry. We all have a ministry. Every one of you in here, you have a ministry. You have a job to do. And it's the ministry of reconciliation. You have the ministry of friendship. God bought your life with the blood of Jesus so that you could turn around and give away friendship with God to the world. And we've made it so hard. Like we have to know all of the theology. Look at this, in verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. Look at this. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. And we implore you, we beg you, we encourage you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God because God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Ladies and gentlemen, you have an easy message to give away that people can be friends with God again. And how hard have we made it? How hard have we made it to the point where we've locked ourselves in our own room and in our own churches 
thinking we need another equation and another method and another revelation and one more of those and two more of these until we actually can go do something. And God's been saying this message is easy. Just freely give away what I freely gave you. Tell people that I've paved the way for them to know me. I've paved the way for them to be friends with me again. I gave my own son so that they could know me. He did the hard work. He did all the hard work. He paved the bridge so that we could bring people across it. And we have that responsibility, one, with our relationship with God, but two, to give it away to other people. And I believe this 100% that the greatest offering you'll ever bring is an unbeliever. The greatest offering you'll ever bring God is an unbeliever. And I'd say many of them, many, many, many of them.